the subject of today's session is labeled here Isaiah 14b, which actually means we're beginning from the third verse of chapter 14, having included the first two verses in our previous discussion, 14a. As we've noted on many occasions, the division of the books of the, the Bible into chapters is relatively late, not especially authoritative, and at times fairly arbitrary. So we don't feel especially beholden to the exact division of the chapters. Truth is that in particular, when we consider the subject matter that we are discussing presently, the division of chapters 13 and 14 into two separate units is not only a bit arbitrary, it's a bit unreasonable. That is, as we have noted, beginning in chapter 13, we have a set of prophecies in Isaiah. In Hebrew, each one is described as a masa, which is the Hebrew word for burden. And indeed, these prophecies are quite a burden. In particular, describing the punishment, the retribution of God against the nations. And with respect to this set of prophecies, again, each of which is called a Masa, this set stretching from chapter 13 through chapter 23, around 10 of these prophecies called Masa, we'll note that they are very clearly of unequal length. And the longer among these prophecies, generally in the common reckoning, are subdivided into two chapters. Well, we are, of course, in the first of these Masa burden prophecies. You may recall, we considered the first half of it last time, beginning in chapter 13, verse 1, the burden of Babylon. This is not only the first of the Masa burden prophecies, it is also by far the longest. And it is indeed subdivided into these two chapters. 13 and 14. Well, practically speaking, it would be a very long prophecy for us to discuss in one session were we not to subdivide it, so we have. But it is, of course, important for us to bear in mind, this is really a continuation of the same prophecy that began with chapter 13. And perhaps on that note, besides recalling that it is indeed the burden of Babylon, we should recall a bit of the introduction that we discussed when we embarked upon our discussion of chapter 13, because it applies here as well. The burden of Babylon. Babylon, what is a prophecy concerning Babylon doing in Isaiah altogether? As we noted last time, Babylon appears for the first time in Isaiah in chapter 13, as indeed, well, it might, because Babylon was not a key player at all on the stage of history in the time of the prophet Isaiah. And it certainly was not a major actor in this part of the world. So why indeed does Isaiah have a whole prophecy on the subject of Babylon and its destruction. Well, you may recall that one of the other chapters of Isaiah that perhaps is especially germane in this regard is the prophecy that pertains most explicitly to Babylon in chapter 39. Let's recall for a moment what takes place in chapter 39. Because on the one hand, 
it certainly accentuates the question, why are we talking about Babylon here? But as we noted, it also in a way provides a kind of answer. In chapter 39, we read, beginning with verse one, at that time, that is following the miraculous recovery of King Hezekiah from his ailment. Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent a letter and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and was recovered. And what follows in verse two is a description of how King Hezekiah gives the emissaries the VIP treatment and indeed shows them all of his treasures, everything that is in the royal house. And then in verse three, then came Isaiah the prophet unto King Hezekiah and said unto him, what said these men? And from whence came they unto you? And Hezekiah said, they are come from a far land unto me, even from Babylon. One gets the sense that King Hezekiah doesn't even know too much about this far land other than its remoteness, that it's far away. Which of course, again, further accentuates the extent to which Babylon was really not a significant player, certainly not in this part of the world at this time. And what then follows? Isaiah asks Hezekiah, what have they seen in your house? And Hezekiah answered, all that is in my house have they seen. There's nothing among my treasures that I have not shown them. Then said Isaiah to Hezekiah, hear the word of the God of hosts. Behold, the days come that all that is in your house and that which your fathers have laid up in store until this day shall be carried to Babylon. Nothing shall be left. Devastating prophecy. And of course, again, on the one hand, further accentuating that Babylon will indeed be a major player on the stage of world history, and in particular on the stage of the history of Israel, but generations in the future, not now. And of course, simultaneously, the very message in chapter 39, in a way, provides us with an answer as to how we should relate to the prophet Isaiah speaking about this faraway land that will only become significant in a faraway time. And that is Isaiah, need we note, is a prophet of God. And God's messages to his chosen prophets include making known to them that which takes place in faraway places and in times that are scarcely imaginable. That indeed is the hallmark of the true prophet of God, because of course, God knows. And when we consider then what we are to learn from this prophecy in chapter 14, indeed, the totality of the burden of Babylon in chapters 13 and 14, perhaps it is precisely this message of what takes place on the stage of history. There is, after all, for the drama unfolding, a master playwright. As Isaiah expresses it in chapter 41, verse 4, who has wrought and done it? He that called the generations from the beginning, I, God, who am the first and with the last, am the same. That is the message of a prophecy that pertains to Babylon, a nation that will only rise to prominence after several generations. And not only a prophecy pertaining to Babylon, but pertaining to its destruction, to its downfall, after its rise to prominence, 
accentuates everything that, that takes place in history that may appear superficially to be haphazard, chaotic, unguided, is all part of the plan. And there is the playwright. There is the master who crafted this plan that is unfolding. There's an additional dimension that is particularly germane when we consider this prophecy and especially chapter 14, which we're discussing today. When we consider this stage of history upon which the various nations strut for their moment of glory, there is indeed an ongoing succession as nations rise and fall. They hold up high their torch until it burns out. And then they subside into darkness, into oblivion. We have a tradition. It is indeed one of many interpretations, but one of the traditional interpretations of God's inaugural prophecy to our father Jacob pertains to this very message. When Jacob, as we read in Genesis chapter 28, in verse 12, dreams, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Note, first ascending, then descending. And what is this ladder? We aren't told. But it is significant to, to consider what it is in the context of the following verse. And behold, God stood. Well, there is an indefinite pronoun used in the Hebrew. We could render it as God stood over him, over Jacob. It could also be God stood over it, over the ladder. One of the interpretations in our tradition is this ladder, is the ladder of history. And the angels ascending and descending on this ladder are the angels, as we read in the book of Daniel, that are charged as God's officers, as it were, over the various nations. In the book of Daniel, we read of the officer of Greece, the officer of Persia, and each of them has its stage to ascend the ladder, to reach its zenith, to stand in prominence, only afterward to descend and disappear. This idea that is perhaps intimated in the inaugural prophecy of our father Jacob is, of course, very prominently expressed, albeit in mystical terms, in the book of Daniel, where in particular we read in Daniel in chapter 7 of the frightening vision that Daniel has of four monstrous beasts in succession. And the message of that vision, as explicitly stated in chapter 7, in verse 17, these great beasts, which are four, are four kingdoms that shall arise out of the earth. Again, the succession of kingdoms, kingdoms, not merely in a mundane sense, in the sense of those kingdoms that hold sway over the world, as it were by divine proxy. Until when? In verse 18. But the high holy ones, we could also render it as the holy ones of the most high, shall receive the kingdom. 
and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. That is, there's a process unfolding in the world. After the kingdom was stripped from Israel, when Israel was sent into exile, a succession of kingdoms holds sway over the world. On the stage of history, each one rises in turn and then falls, reaches its prominence and subsides. Until when? Until the time is ripe for the kingdom of God to be reestablished forever and ever in the hands of his holy ones. This isn't, of course, by any means a message of a tyranny by Israel. On the contrary, consider that part of the message that God communicates to Jacob in that inaugural prophecy that we also see as intimating this succession of kingdoms is in you and in your seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That blessing comes through the establishment of God's kingdom. But in the interim, there is indeed a succession of kingdoms. And the blessing, one way or another, is going to be manifest through them, through their rise. And most prominently in Isaiah chapter 14, through their fall. But when we consider what that communicates to us when we study these prophecies, you know, there's an obvious question that inevitably arises. We noted this briefly when we began chapter 13. So considering that Babylon hasn't even for all intents and purposes appeared on the stage of history yet, what of all this did the prophet Isaiah communicate to his contemporaries? And inevitably, our answer is, we have no idea. We don't know if any of this was communicated to Isaiah's contemporaries or even to the first initial generations after him who would have been clueless as to what all of the commotion over Babylon is. But then recall, we noted God's words in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16, bind up the testimony, seal the instruction, the Torah, the teaching, among my disciples. God, of course, refers to the students of Isaiah as God's disciples. And perhaps these prophecies were consigned to Isaiah's disciples, God's disciples, who were studying under Isaiah, for them to maintain a hidden tradition, maybe even scrolls that were sealed not to be opened until the time would be appropriate. Bind up the testimony, seal the instruction. It's not time yet. It will be, as the prophet expresses it in verse 17 in chapter eight, and I will wait for God. God who hides his face from the house of Jacob, and I will hope for him. Because these words will be, but they won't be now. And maybe in a sense, when we consider these prophecies that are of almost no relevance to Isaiah's own contemporaries, we're interacting with Isaiah on an extraordinary level in which he's actually speaking more to us than he is to his own people in his own time. So it is on that note then that we consider what we have to learn from this second half of the burden of Babylon. And let us in that vein immediately embark with the parable against the king of Babylon that begins with verse 4.
How has the oppressor ceased? The exactress of gold of the haughty one, the word in the Hebrew is obscure because it doesn't appear anywhere else in the Bible, but has ceased. Verse five, God has broken the staff of the wicked, the rod of the rulers. Again, Rabbalon hasn't even become a ruler. It hasn't even become an oppressor yet, but it will. And this is its fate inexorably because the prophet viewing history so to speak yet unborn but in retrospect speaks of a nation that smote the peoples in wrath with an incessant stroke that ruled the nations in anger pursued without relenting and what's the consequence of babylon ceasing to be the whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. The cypresses rejoice at you, the cedars of Lebanon. This global rejoicing over the destruction of Babylon is something that pertains to an issue that we've discussed elsewhere. But it certainly is germane for us to consider it here. And that is the whole notion of rejoicing when others are destroyed, even if they are wicked. Because as we've noted, on the one hand, we certainly find this idea communicated likewise in Proverbs. In Proverbs chapter 11, verse 10, when the wicked are lost, there is joy. The only thing is, as we've also noted, we get more than one message in the book of Proverbs. That is, in Proverbs chapter 24, Verse 17, we read, rejoice not when your enemy falls and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Now, it is, of course, tempting, as we've also noted elsewhere, to compare the thrust of chapter 24 with the tr thrust of chapter 11. After all, in chapter 11, verse 10, there is explicitly reference to the wicked. In chapter 24, in verse 17, we're not speaking of the wicked, we're speaking of your enemy. So when your enemy falls, don't be glad, don't rejoice. It is, again, tempting to say one verse applies to the wicked, the other to your enemy, except when we consider the broader context in chapter 24, that seems a bit implausible. After all, the verse immediately preceding verse 17, verse 16, notes that the wicked stumble in the evil. That reference explicitly to the wicked certainly lends credence to the assumption that in verse 17, even though the verse speaks of your enemy, it's speaking of the, the wicked as well. And as we've noted elsewhere, the resolution of these seemingly disparate and even contradictory messages may therefore be somewhat more subtle. Because in truth, we may indeed be speaking of wicked people in both chapter 24, verse 17, and in chapter 11, verse 10. The question still will remain, how are you relating to those people? Because even though someone may be categorically wicked, the moment that you relate to that person, not as part of the category of the wicked, but rather as your enemy, your ego, is insinuating itself into the discussion. Your rejoicing then is liable not to be a matter of rejoicing over the downfall of evil, over the wicked being overcome, but rather rejoicing over a personal vendetta. And then it becomes an expression of nothing more than your own egotism. And maybe that's precisely the question that we always need to ask ourselves.
when we exult over righteousness prevailing over wickedness. That's a good thing, right? Only if it's not an expression of our own egos. Only if there's something more exalted in it than my enemy has fallen, has stumbled. But nonetheless, inescapably, there is rejoicing when wickedness is triumphed. And as we've noted, this is an inescapable conclusion when one considers the consequences of wickedness. As we read in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 3, when the wicked comes, there comes also contempt and with shame, reproach. And we can well appreciate by consequence in Proverbs chapter 28, verse 28, when the wicked rise, men hide themselves, but when they are lost, the righteous increase. And what happens when the righteous increase? In chapter 29, verse 2, when the righteous are increased, the people rejoice. And of course, then, when one considers the devastating consequences of the wicked increasing, then we appreciate the righteous shall gaze upon their fall and shall gaze upon their fall ultimately with that sense of rejoicing that we indeed find expressed in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 10. It could not, after all, be otherwise. After all, when the wicked prosper, not only do they bring ruin upon the world, they really bring ruin upon their own selves. They corrupt their own souls. And indeed, in our tradition, there is nothing better for the wicked than their own failure, than their inability to rise up and triumph. It's the opposite with respect to the righteous. Their success is not only success for them, it's success for the entire world. I will stress one additional caveat, and we've also noted this elsewhere. When we consider what the triumph over wickedness means, well, of course, it can mean different things in different contexts. We have noted the thrust of Psalm 104, verse 35, the final verse of the Psalm. In particular, in the context of the story I shared with you in our tradition, that the great sage Rabbi Meir, who had wicked, vicious neighbors, wanted to pray for their destruction until his wise, pious wife, Bruria, called his attention to this verse and said, what are you thinking? Are you thinking that this verse is telling you that we need to wipe out sinners? Well, when we consider the Hebrew, although we could translate yitamu chata'im min ha'aretz as let sinners cease out of the earth, chata'im is a word unlike chot'im that only means sinners, that could also mean sins. So don't read it as let sinners cease out of the earth, but rather let sins cease out of the earth. And of course, once sins cease out of the earth, then the wicked will be no more. Not because they won't exist, but because they'll no longer be wicked. So don't pray for them to be destroyed. Pray for them to repent. And of course, as we noted in our tradition, there's a happy ending to the story. He listens to the wise words of his wife and prays for them to repent. And in the end, they do. Well, one way or the other, we must look forward to the eventual triumph of righteousness over wickedness and the destruction of wickedness. Because as we've noted, you know, the thrust of this verse that we have, of course, studied previously in Isaiah chapter six, verse three, that the seraphim called one unto another and said, holy, holy, holy is the God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. That needs to be a realization that we can all share. When wickedness prevails, God's glory is obscured. Of course, we recognize 
God himself cannot be in any way compromised by the success of the wickedness. But our ability to connect with God's glory certainly is. So we do strive and yearn for the day when wickedness will be triumphed, when it will no longer prevail, and when everyone will be able to appreciate holy, holy, holy is the God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now, returning to Isaiah chapter 14, what follows after this introductory section is a very vivid, very colorful, and very detailed description of what happens to the king of Babylon. From verse 9, the netherworld from beneath quakes, shudders for you to meet you at your coming. The giants or shades are roused for you. Even all the chief ones of the earth, all the kings of the nations are raised up from their thrones. This, of course, in the netherworld. All they do answer and say unto you, are you also become weak as we? Are you become like unto us? The pride is brought down to the netherworld. The noise of your psalteries, the maggot is spread under you, the worms cover you. In other words, in vivid detail, a description of how the king of Babylon is going to hell. Now, we should note that this theme of the netherworld, this theme of the pit of destruction, is one that we encounter in a number of prophecies elsewhere in the Bible. And uh, perhaps in particular, we should cite in this regard four passages in Ezekiel. First, in Ezekiel chapter 26, when we read the prophecy that the prophet Ezekiel delivers to Tyre, and it likewise is a prophecy of destruction. In verse 17, how are you lost? The praised city that was strong in the sea, you and your inhabitants, and the vivid description likewise in verse 20, then will I bring you down with them that descend into the pit. Again, hell, the pit of destruction, the people of old time, and will make you to dwell in the nether parts of the earth. And similarly, also referring to the prince of Tyre, in Ezekiel chapter 28, we read of the pretensions of the prince of Tyre. Your heart is lifted up, and you have said, I am the God. And the consequence of this is, in verse 7, I will be strangers upon you. The dreaded of the nations, in verse 8, they shall bring you down to the pit, and you shall die the deaths of them that are slain. Continuing in this progression, we read in far greater elaboration, in Ezekiel chapter 31, the prophecy of destruction with respect to Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And uh, we'll note in this regard that there is also reference to the destruction of Assyria, something that we'll see plays prominently in our chapter, in Isaiah chapter 14 as well. But of course, again, for our purposes, what is particularly germane in the continuation of chapter 31, we read in verse 14, they are all delivered unto death to the nether parts of the earth, in the midst of the children of men with them that go down to the pit. And in verse 15, in the day when he went down to the netherworld, I, God, caused the deep to mourn and cover itself for him. Again, in further detail describing the destruction that is so vividly detailed that takes place to Pharaoh and all his multitude. 
And perhaps most of all, in Ezekiel chapter 32, we have a roster, not merely Tyre or Egypt, but a description of nation after nation. In chapter 32, verse 18, wail for the multitude of Egypt and cast them down, even her with the daughters of the mighty nations onto the nether parts of the earth with them that go down into the pit. And likewise, in verse 22, Assyria is there and all her company, their graves are round about them, all of them slain, pulling them on the sword. In verse 24, there is Elam and all her multitude round about her grave, all of them slain, fallen by the sword. Verse 26, there is Meshech Tubal and all her multitude, her graves are round about them. And finally, in verse 29, there is Edom, her kings and all her princes, who for all their might are laid with them that are slain by the sword. In the broader context of the rise and fall of nations, if we might otherwise have asked, well, what happens with the nations after their moment in the sun, their brief interval of glory is over? Well, here we see what happens. In the words of Ezekiel, in the words of Isaiah, a fate of utmost destruction. Utmost destruction, why? And of course here, it's crucial for us to appreciate what the recurrent theme in both the words of Isaiah and the words of Ezekiel was. That is, returning to our chapter, Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, how are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of the morning? You thought you were really great, didn't you? In verse 13, you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. Above the stars of God will I exalt my throne, and I will sit upon the mount of meeting in the uttermost parts of the north. That pretentiousness, that arrogance, you were on the move. You thought you were soaring to the highest of heights. You were indeed on the move, but your trajectory brought you right into hell. On the move for better and for worse. And when you generate for yourself that sort of dynamism, but it's a dynamism based upon nothing but your own pride and arrogance, what you have done, in fact, is set the stage for your own destruction. And indeed, we saw this theme repeatedly in the words of Ezekiel as well, just to excerpt very briefly, we note in chapter 26, in verse 17, you were the renowned, praised city in Chapter 28, your heart is lifted up and you have said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the heart of the seas. In chapter 31, of course, with respect to the pretentiousness of Pharaoh in describing how Assyria was so arrogant and how you too, because you are exalted in stature and has set his top among the interwoven boughs, his heart is lifted up in his height. All of this is what paves the way for your utmost destruction. And yet, of course, inevitably, we recognize that it's by no means such a simple black and white array, because the very fact that nations are involved in this dynamism of growth and development is after all, by no means intrinsically, necessarily bad. Of course, it depends what they do with it. And to that extent then, we could never presume that all of the nations are heading exclusively for the netherworld, for hell. We've noted elsewhere that in particular with respect to this uh, very dire prophecy concerning Edom, 
in Ezekiel chapter 32, verse 29, there is Edom, her kings and all her princes. We have in our tradition an interesting caveat. Her kings, but not all her kings, because there are righteous kings from Edom as well. All her princes, well, all her princes doesn't leave much room for flexibility. It says all her princes, all her princes, but not all her officers, because there are righteous officers in Edom as well. Everyone has the opportunity to choose. And that, of course, inexorably is one of the most important messages that emerge from this dire prophecy of destruction. The dire prophecies, because they did choose and they chose badly. But the choice itself is the greatest blessing. Which brings me to an interesting additional observation that pertains in particular to the continuation of the pretentious, arrogant boasts of the king of Babylon. After describing his exalting his throne and sitting above the stars of God, we read in verse 14, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. The most high. I'll be like God. Of course, just reading these words, we veritably recoil in disgust the hubris, the arrogance, how dare he? This blasphemous taunt, I will be like the Most High. And yet, I feel compelled to share with you a very deep insight into these words. Just before we get to the insight, I need to take a couple of steps backward in order to provide some crucial background material. The background material pertains to the very essence of man's identity. Because inevitably, we need to ask ourselves, what does the Torah teach us about the essence of man's identity? Well, we read in Genesis chapter 5, in verses 1 and 2, this is the book of the generations of man, of Adam, Adam, and with respect to that name, we read explicitly in verse 2, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name Adam, Adam, in the day when they were created. Just tantalizingly, despite the fact that we read explicitly here that God named man, we aren't told what the derivation of the name is. We consider the first place that the word Adam, Adam, appears in the Torah. And tantalizingly, we don't really get any clarification there either. In Genesis chapter 1, in verse 26, God said, let us make man. In the Hebrew, Adam, Adam. In our image, like our likeness. And indeed, so in verse 27, he does. God created Et ha'adam, the man, in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. But no one ever explained to us, what's the name? What does it mean? But by implication, we get an answer, just not in Genesis chapter 1, rather in Genesis chapter 2, in verse 7. Because at least if you read the text in Hebrew, you get a very clear play on words, the juxtaposition. Then God the Lord formed man at Ha-Adam, Adam, out of the dust of the ground, min Ha-Adama, and breathed into his nostrils the breath or soul of life, and man, Ha-Adam, became a living creature. Note, the ground, the earth, Adama, and the name given to man, Adam. There's obviously a connection. So it's only natural for us to say, well, this is the derivation 
of the Hebrew word for man, Adam, Adam, coming from Adama. A very convenient explanation, just by itself, woefully inadequate. First of all, woefully inadequate because is man the only thing that comes from the ground, from Adama? In verse 19, we read, and out of the ground, which in the Hebrew is min ha-adama, exactly the same word that's used with respect to the creation of man, God the Lord formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air. So they also come from Adama, but they're not called Adam. Indeed, in Genesis chapter 1, the closest reference that we have to any sort of etymology of Adam in the verse before the creation of man is a reference to creating everything that creeps upon the ground, Hebrew, Adama. So once again, we ask ourselves, why should man be called Adam for Adama? Besides, is the earth really what so best epitomizes the unique endowment of a human being? We would think that it is the soul that God breathes into Adam that should have no doubt take precedence. So why should man be called a name because of Adama? And uh, in this regard, I feel compelled to share with you first an insight of one of the great Jewish thinkers of the 16th century, Rabbi Judah Loi Liva of Prague, often known by the acronym the Maharal of Prague, who indeed posits that the name of man, Adam, comes from the ground, Adama, but not because that was the substrate. Rather, because when we consider in our frame of reference, what does the earth signify? It signifies the mechanism for actualizing potential. You take a tiny seed and put it in the ground, and that potential becomes actualized. And where that tiny seed was placed, a mighty tree grows. And that, comments Maharal, is what the human condition is all about, actualizing potential. As opposed to the beast, animals don't have any spiritual potential to actualize. They are created as physical beings, so they remain, and so they perish. On the other end, the angels, the angels have no potential to actualize because they are created, actual spiritual beings. A human being, a human being comes into the world as a physical being with a latent spiritual potential that needs to be actualized. That is what man is all about. Is that all we have to say about the subject? Well, obviously not, because this is all background to share with you an insight with respect to chapter 14, verse 14 in Isaiah. And uh, here, once again, I'm going to focus upon the Hebrew. I will be like the Most High in the Hebrew, Edame. Edame. Adama. Adam. Now, of course, literally, we aren't speaking of cognates at all because this is, after all, a particular conjugation of the root that means be like. But nonetheless, one of the great Hasidic masters of the latter part of the 19th century, Rabbi Tzadok HaKohen Rabinowitz of the city of Lublin, proposed that in this word, Edame, we can discern the underlying derivation of Adam, that man is so called Adam, because of Edame, I will be like the Most High. Now, at first brush, this proposal seems absolutely bewildering, even shocking. 
After all, we're speaking here of the pretentious, blasphemous taunts of the king of Babylon. I will be like God. And yet, once again, we recall what we do with the choices that we have is in our hands. The potentiality, the capacity to act, that is what, more than anything else, defines the human condition. In a sense, what Rabbi Tzadok is proposing is actually very similar conceptually to what Maral proposed with respect to Adama as what actualizes potential. Because this is perhaps the most vivid expression of man not sitting still, man constantly on the move, man having capacity to attain a level that transcends everything else. Indeed, everything, including the ministering angels. On the one hand, it's important for us to emphasize this point. As we read in the prophecy of Hosea, Hosea in chapter 12, verse 5, this is simply a synopsis of what we know from Genesis chapter 32, Jacob strove with an angel and prevailed. He, the angel, wept and made supplication unto him. Man has that capacity. And we've noted this in the past, as expressed so vividly in the blessing that God communicates to Zechariah in Zechariah chapter 3, verse 7, for Joshua, the high priest. If you will walk in my ways and if you will keep my charge and will also judge my house and will also keep my courts, then I shall give you walkers among these standing ones. There are alternative translations, but this I think is the most literal. What are walkers? What are standing ones? And of course, inevitably, the answer is the standing ones are the angels. As we read in Ezekiel chapter 1, their legs were straight legs. They turned not when they went. They went, everyone, straight forward. They don't turn. They don't grow. They are not dynamic. As opposed to man. Man is the walker. Always on the move. This, of course, is all on the one hand. It's important for us to appreciate. Is that any sort of guarantee of human greatness? Well, that's the other hand. The answer, of course, is certainly not. As we read in Job chapter 5, verse 7, man, Adam, is born to labor, not to trouble. The flying beings fly upward. The angels fly upward. Man toils, man labors. Man is born into trouble. And as we read in Psalm 49, what that necessarily dictates is just how ephemeral human existence is and any sort of human greatness. In verse 13, but man, Adam, abides not in honor. He is like the beasts that are silenced. Verse 21, man, Adam, that is in honor, understands not. Again, he is like the beasts that are silenced. Guarantees we certainly don't have. But it's important for us to appreciate that these verses that express just how ephemeral human greatness is, simultaneously intimate the potential that we have if we harness what God gives us, if we seize upon the opportunity, if we actualize the potential. In that vein, ironically, the pretentious blasphemy of the king of Babylon, I will be like the Most High, can indeed be an uplifting expression of what through the greatness with which God endows us, we can do.
because we really can, on some plane, come to be like the Most High by making ourselves godly. That wasn't what the King of Babylon had in mind, was it? But we can. And of course, what follows then in our chapter is a very detailed description of the downfall of the King of Babylon. Our time is limited, so we won't be able to discuss all of the verses inside. But um, what I would like to stress in particular is when we get to the closing words of this prophecy of doom for Babylon, we read in verses 22 and 23, and I will rise up against them, says the God of hosts, and cut off from Babylon name and remnants, son and grandson, says God. I will also make it a heritage for the bittern and pools of water, and I will sweep it with a broom of destruction, says the God of hosts. And while ostensibly with this, we conclude the prophecy of destruction for Babylon, there is a crucial addendum of sorts that doesn't seem to be relevant to Babylon at all. Verses 24 and 25. The God of hosts has sworn, saying, surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass, and as I have purposed, so shall it stand, that I will break Assyria in my land, and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them and his burden depart from off their shoulder. Assyria? Were we talking about Babylon? Now, there are a number of levels of understanding of what is taking place in this invocation here of Assyria. Of course, perhaps the most straightforward is, recall, until this point, we're speaking of a nation, Babylon, that is a veritable abstraction in the time of Isaiah. So in some sense, God says the guarantor of the destruction of Babylon is Assyria, because Assyria is being destroyed now. And as I break Assyria, so shall I break Babylon. This idea is one that we find expressed in the words of another prophet coming from a different historical vantage point. The prophet Jeremiah in chapter 50 also juxtaposes Assyria with Babylon and indeed in much this vein. What happened to Assyria is a guarantee for what will happen to Babylon. We read in Jeremiah chapter 50 verses 17 and 18, Israel is a scattered sheep. The lions have driven him away. First, the king of Assyria has devoured him. And last, this Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, has broken his bones. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, behold, I will visit upon the king of Babylon and his land as I have visited upon the king of Assyria. So indeed, there is that link between the dire fate of the one and of the other. But of course, on a deeper plane, we appreciate that what the two have so vividly in common is precisely the arrogant pretensions that led to them both being destroyed. Now, once again, of course, we stress the story of destruction is never the end of the story. It all depends, of course, upon what we do, how we internalize this message into our own lives. And of course, from our vantage point today, looking back on both the Assyrian Empire and the Babylonian Empire as empires that have so utterly been destroyed 
besides the Bible, whoever hears about them, what we need to learn is how we should harness that dynamism in our own lives in a much different direction. That inevitably is the bond between the words of destruction with respect to Babylon and Assyria in Jeremiah chapter 50 and the following verses that pertain to Israel. Verse 19, I will bring back Israel unto his habitation and he shall feed on Carmel and Bashan and his soul shall be satisfied upon the hills of Ephraim and in Gilad. In those days and in that, that time, says God, the iniquity of Israel will be sought for and there shall be none and the sins of Judah and they shall not be found for I will pardon them whom I leave as a remnant. And indeed, to that extent, then there is the vengeance of God, the vengeance of his temple against Babylon and simultaneously the promise to Israel. As we read later on in the chapter in verses 33 and 34, the children of Israel and the children of Judah are oppressed together and all that took them captives hold them fast. They refuse to let them go. Their redeemer is strong. The God of hosts is his name. He will thoroughly plead their quarrel that he may give rest to the earth and disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. Disquiet the inhabitants of Babylon. They again are on the move, but they are on the move ultimately to their own destruction. And Again, we return to the theme of Babylon and Assyria. And the message emergent in particular from the destruction of Assyria, as it bears on the whole story of Babylon here as well. Consider again in verse 25, I will break Assyria in my land and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. We've considered in other contexts, the significance of my land in the Bible. Whenever God says my land, this of course should surprise no one, that there's only one land to which he is referring. And that of course is this one, the land of Israel. But furthermore, as we've also noted, when God says my land, inevitably, it's because someone was trying to forget about that. Now, with respect to Assyria being destroyed, God says, in my land, we understand exactly what the background of the emphasis on my land is. And this becomes clear when we consider the arrogant boastings of Rav Shaker, the emissary of Sennacherib. In Isaiah chapter 36, beginning in verse 13, hear you the words of the great king, the king of Assyria, and the message in verse 18, beware lest Hezekiah persuade you saying, God will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? And there's a list. Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? Have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand, that God should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? I'm in control. I call the shots. Oh, yeah. And of course, again, I will break Assyria in my land. Someone's forgotten whose land it is and needs a reminder. Assyria will be utterly destroyed, broken, specifically in my land, where. I remind you, as we read in the book of Kings and in the book of Isaiah and in the book of Chronicles, 185,000 soldiers of the Assyrian Empire go to sleep and don't wake up. My land. That's chronologically the first place where God emphasizes my land in the Bible. But to recall briefly the others, we encounter the expression, my land, in the Hebrew, Aretzi, twice in Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 7, 
I brought you into the land of fruitful fields to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. And in Jeremiah chapter 16, verse 18, first I will recompense their iniquity and their sin double because they have profaned my land. They have filled my heritage with the carcasses of their detestable things and their abominations. So, as we have noted, with profound embarrassment, these prophecies are talking about Israel. Because Israel, too, is not immune by any means to forgetting whose land it is. One of the greatest dangers is the possibility of our thinking that the land of Israel belongs to the nation of Israel. It doesn't. It belongs to God. God designated the land of Israel for the nation of Israel. But it's not our authority. And of course, as we've noted, it's also not the authority of the San Remo Conference, nor the League of Nations, nor the ratification of the mandate by the United Nations. None of that. It's straight from God. My land. And when we forget, God reminds us. Besides these two instances in Jeremiah, we also have two instances in which the prophet Ezekiel sees fit to emphasize my land. The first in Ezekiel chapter 36, the context. The enemy has said against you, aha, even the ancient high places become our heritage. And we read in the continuation in Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 5. Therefore, thus says God the Lord, surely in the fire of my jealousy have I spoken against the residue of the nations and against all Edom that have appointed my land unto themselves for a heritage with the joy of all their heart, with disdain of soul to cast it out for a prey. It wasn't theirs. My land. And the continuation in verse 6, Behold, I have spoken in my jealousy and in my fury because you have borne the shame of the nations. Surely the nations that are round about you, they shall bear their shame. And the promise of consolation to Israel when Israel learned its lesson. The second place in Ezekiel where we find my land is in chapter 38, when Gog brings his hordes against the land of Israel. We read in verses 15 and 16, you shall come from your place out of the uttermost parts of the north, you and many peoples with you, all them riding upon horses, a great company and a mighty army, and you shall come against my people Israel, my people, as a cloud to cover the land, and it shall be in the end of days that I will bring you against my land, my land, that the nations may know me when I shall be sanctified through you, O Gog, before their eyes, that is, through your utter destruction. And indeed, in the continuation, we read in verse 18, it shall come to pass in that day when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury shall arise up in my nostrils. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. And there is indeed a very vivid description of the conflagration, the cataclysm that destroys the hordes of Gog and Magog. So to recap in brief, then, Isaiah reminds Assyria, my land. Jeremiah twice reminds Israel, my land. Ezekiel in chapter 36 reminds Edom and the other nations with Edom. And in chapter 38, Gog and his hordes, my land. And perhaps as an apt synopsis, the prophet Joel, in the last chapter of Joel, in some divisions of the chapters of Joel, this may be chapter three, depending on how many chapters there are in Joel. In any case, it's the last chapter. In my reckoning, it's chapter four here. We read in verse two, God says, I will gather all nations and bring them down unto the valley of Jehoshaphat, which means God judges. And I will enter into judgment with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and divided my land. It wasn't theirs. Again, 
they need to be reminded. The dire consequences of having partitioned my land. Because ultimately, of course, it's crucial for us to bear in mind, being on the move, growing, going, is always means. The question is, what is the end to which these means are directed? The land of Israel is intended as the utmost means for growing towards God. Anyone who comes into this land, anyone who tampers with this land, without the keen appreciation that this land is God's palace, is doomed. Because as God says over and over again, my land means to an end. One who fails to appreciate that will not endure in this land. And it is, of course, on precisely that note that the prophet Joel concludes that final chapter. What happens when we do learn the message? Then Judah will be inhabited forever and Jerusalem from generation to generation. And I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed. And God dwells in Zion. The ultimate balancing of the books, the divine ledger. But there's one additional theme that I feel in particular compelled to stress in verse 25. And that is, you'll note, Isaiah doesn't only refer to, I will break Assyria in my land. He also adds, upon my mountains, tread him underfoot. Now, the emphasis upon mountains is something that we have discussed elsewhere. Indeed, when Ezekiel speaks of the mountains of Israel, as we've noted, Ezekiel in exile in Babylon is pining for the geography of the land of Israel. There are no mountains in Babylon. The land of Israel, as we read in Deuteronomy chapter 11, is a land of mountains and valleys. And of course, on some plane, the emphasis in my mountains is the same as my land. Remember whose land it is. Remember whose mountains they are. And in much this vein, in the prophecy of doom and destruction for Gog and Magog, we read in Ezekiel chapter 38, verse 21, I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, says God the Lord. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. Of course, the ultimate punishment, the destruction of the hordes of Gog and Magog, they take place likewise. My land, my mountains. But perhaps there's an additional dimension. When we emphasize mountains, in particular, and of course, the context of today's discussion about moving, going, growing, mountains are there to climb. When we have guests from abroad, in particular from the lowlands, like the Netherlands, and I take them around in our neighborhood, Har Nof Mountain View, which of course is on a mountainside, I point out that there's a lot of climbing. There's always a lot of climbing. As we read in Psalm 125, verse 2, as the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so God is round about his people from this time forth and forever. It becomes very clear when I take groups to visit the holy city, you can see how the city of David is indeed literally surrounded by mountains. But besides the literal meaning, to reach the level of Jerusalem, you always have to climb. You must be in this vein, a climber to grow, to never just sit back, to appreciate that being on the move is the greatest gift. And in particular, with respect to Jerusalem, one can't help but add here 
that the theme of ascending to Jerusalem is one that we find explicitly articulated. First, in Psalm 122, verse 4, with respect to Israel, where the tribes went up, even the tribes of God, as a testimony unto Israel to give thanks unto the name of God. Again, when the tri- where the tribes went up, ascended. And not only with respect to Israel, the entire world. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 3. And many peoples will go and say, go you and let us go up to the mountain of God, to the house of the God of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion will go forth the Torah and the word of God from Jerusalem. Again, going up. Everyone goes up. Since everyone goes up, when we consider the significance of the symbolism, my mountains, it's not only as a reminder and as a warning for those who forget, there's also a promise when we consider God's mountains. And this is something that is dramatically expressed in two other passages in Isaiah. When we read in Isaiah chapter 49, I will make all my mountains away, and my high well shall be raised on high. Behold, these shall come from far, and lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sinim. Sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and break forth into singing, O mountains. For God has comforted his people and has compassion upon his poor. And similarly, in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 9, I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob and out of Judah, a possessor of my mountains. And my chosen shall possess it, and my servants shall dwell there. My mountains, my mountains are also there as a consolation and as a promise. Because when you learn how to climb, when you dedicate yourself to climbing, when you appreciate what a gift it is, that God gives you endless mountains to climb toward him so that every moment of life is an opportunity to move, to go, to grow. There is no greater consolation than being a possessor of God's mountains. This brings us to the conclusion of the burden of Babylon with the final words that we read in verse 27. The God of hosts has purposed and who shall disannul it and his hand is stretched out and who shall turn it back? So of course, on the most basic plane, we will appreciate the message. The message, as we noted at the outset, there's a master playwright. And in particular, in this prophecy, where we get a glimpse of the master playwright who has written the script generations in advance, it's important to stress this point. Nothing that happens in history is an accident. Nothing that happens in history is purposeless. God has purposed. Who shall disannul it? Simultaneously, we'll stress an additional dimension, an additional dimension that Isaiah himself stresses later on in Isaiah chapter 55. Beginning in verse eight, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. And what ultimately is the significance of that? In verse 11, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me empty handed, except it accomplish that which I desire, and make the thing whereto I sent it prosper. The world, the whole world, is a reflection of that divine thought. And the challenge it confers upon us, more than anything else, when we consider what that divine purpose teaches us, it teaches us the greatest gift, the greatest opportunity is for us to seize upon this world that God has given us, 
a world in which we're always on the move and in which we always have the opportunity to choose to climb. But of course, simultaneously, we can distract ourselves. And when we do, we keep on moving, but we move in the direction of the pit of destruction. But when we integrate the message of the warning that the prophet gives us, when we learn the message of being on the move in a positive way, there's really no greater gift. There's no greater blessing to be able to indeed instill in everything that we do, God's blessings by our choosing to embrace them. The greatest gift of all. God bless you.